Okay, so Stephen, Stephen Turner from Plant Lives Matter. He's uh, he's from over in Brooksville, right? You run uh, run a native and edible landscaping service. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I'm in Hernando County. It's like an hour, you know, closer to the ocean. So is this good? Okay, good. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's do it. All right. Okay, so first of all, thanks for letting me uh, do this. This is good practice. Um, and I just wanted to uh, show you a couple things. I'm not really here to teach anybody anything. They probably don't already know. Um, I'm, I'm only 30, and I've got dreadlocks, so what do I know, right? <laughs> but, but hey, 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 who else has got dreadlocks in here? Anybody? Oh, what? What's going on here? Okay, that's okay, that's okay. Past life, exactly. So. Um, a little bit about me before I get into this, um, just so I can connect with you guys a little bit more. Just because I have dreads doesn't mean I'm that foreign. Uh, hippie, people call you hippie and everything with dreads, but um, I really grew these because, uh, you know, I was invited into permaculture uh, groups and I uh, lived off grid for a little bit. Um, I did homesteading and that was in my early 20s. Working my way up to where I'm now is my 30s. So. <clears throat> so I grew up uh, the hair because I have curly hair, and it's a pain in the butt when you're off-grid to maintain your hair unless you got an off-grid barber. So we didn't have one. I mean, there was military guys and veterans, but uh, I just decided to grow them out, and it worked out. So um, it gives me character and personality. So anyway, uh, I enjoy them. If you're ever thinking about growing dreadlocks and got curly hair, I recommend it. <laughs> All right, anyway. So, so um through some of this life adventure, um, I ended up being broken homeless in my early 20s because I wanted to see the ocean, and I had the opportunity to get out of the corporate world, which I went right into out of high school, working two jobs, had my own place and roommate and all that. Um, and I, God gave me a beautiful uh, opening, and I took it, and it ended up taking me on roads and pathways where I found challenges, and I overcame some of those challenges. Um, and thanks to permaculture, and holistic um, alternatives. Uh, I kind of got open-minded about things. Um, and my worldview went from the little bubble, I, me, and mine, that we sometimes get stuck into, to a us, we, and our larger sense of community. And this is a lot more than just the people level. This is more of like a, a planetary level and awareness. And so Plant Lives Matter couldn't uh, make a statement even, uh, ever more than it could now as we see new, new development um, at an ever alarming rate. <clears throat> ever alarming rate. Plus, we have uh, so many issues in our society and we're all looking and struggling for some solutions. So um, some of those solutions could be uh, presented and demonstrated in our landscape, which is what I want to show you here. So um, if you want to click the, there you go. So. So I went over development. Um, you know, as we see more development uh, coming in, that's uh, you know up to 800 to 1,000 people every day is estimated to move to Florida. Um, and in the year of 2022, it was 360 something thousand people moved to the state in just one year. So this adds up with new housing. Um, it's up to the the Fish and Wildlife Conservation. Uh, gave a pres presentation, and they estimated up to 500 acres per day is going to new development, and that's roadways, housing communities, and businesses um, all over the state of Florida. And that adds up to roughly half the size of Hernando County, which is the county I came from, and in, you know, in land mass. So it adds up. That's all over the state. <clears throat> so Plant Lives Matter do, uh, does make a statement, and... Uh, not only do plant lives matter, but the right plant in the right place really matters, and the right plants matter. So we're going to go over some of that. Paul, if you want to continue here. Um, we also offer, as a landscape company, uh, different uh, projects and services, like we do some hardscaping. Um, we do your typical landscape services, mowing. But what this does is it gives me an overall picture and connection with people I wouldn't be able to get and reach if I didn't offer these services, you see what I'm saying? If I were to just go out and say, oh, I specialize in edible native plants and that's all I do, 
then I can't connect to people that need mowing services and um, favors and all that. So I've kind of come up with a mix, and it allows me to expand my broad width and connect with more people. Um, and then I can also just plant a seed in their mind saying, hey, uh, I'm, I'm not here to teach about permaculture, but have you thought of planting edible and native plants? And here's why. All right, Paul, go ahead. Um, so plant lives matter. Insects eat, pollinators eat, um, birds, wildlife eats. And because of all this eating in our food web, humans eat too. It's all connected. There's no separation here. Um, Everything from the microbiology in the soil to the insects and wildlife and human lifestyles is all connected. So the more of us that are consuming and destroying our landscapes, it adds up to um, it, 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 like the ecology losing um, you know, uh, deforestation, we're losing a lot of plants and wildlife and food sources, um, especially the way we landscape. Paul, if you want to. Um, so, uh, especially how, how we landscape nowadays is what I was saying. Uh, so, this presentation contains what is a native plant, how native plants fit in the landscape, why plant lives matter, top five native plants for any landscape uh, in our local area, and then keystone plants and support species for all of life. So, what is a native plant? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so, a native plant is basically a well-adapted plant to uh, a region, and that region is based on many things, like maybe the temperature, the elevation, um, what's existing in that area as far as terrain, um, and then some of the, the wildlife. Um, it all kind of works together in, in a natural system. And uh, there's regional native plants, and then there's local native plants. And go over those. Go ahead. Did you click it? Okay. All right, so here's a map of some of the eco regions in the US. And I sourced this from um, a guy I'm going to talk about more, Doug Tallamy. They created, him and his team created a, um, like a system to keep track of the native plants all over the US. So they came, well, they created this map um, for ecoregions. And there's Florida down here, it has two ecoregions. So that just adds diversity because our range is a lot different um, because of you know, temperature and many other factors. We have a lot more water than a lot of the other parts of the US. So that, that, that kind of determines uh, what can grow there. Go ahead. And then there's the zone map, which all of you are probably familiar with. Florida has five different zones, from 11 at the very bottom in the Keys all the way to the top. Uh, we've got eight. So the, the zones also determine what can grow in that area, in that region. But for native plants, it's mostly only determined by ecoregions and not determined by um, uh, what we see here as zones. Zones are mostly for foreign plants. Um, that's how they rate it. Keep, go ahead. OK, so local natives are found throughout a specific local area. Um, this would be specific species only in your local area. It can grow based on geographical features. Plants grow where they can based on soil type, rainfall, temperature, altitude, and past year uh, geological events like glaci glaciation. For example, wild basil, which I actually have right here. Um, it's a plant um, I brought, so if you guys want one, I have extra. But uh, it's mostly only found in southern Florida. But it does grow here, and bees love it. smells good. Um, it's endangered, so the more of us can get this plant, and uh, it's fairly easy to propagate or tell people about, then we can help save it a little bit. But uh, it's a good one for your landscape. Go ahead. How native plants fit in the landscape? Here's a picture of <clears throat> 100 square feet I designed based on uh, you know, several years of practice and experimenting. Uh, so I've got it planted thick so that as these plants mature, uh, everything kind of works together in providing the overall value of this, which would be more of an evergreen look, something that doesn't 
uh, die back in the uh, winters. And it, it, it contains a plant list of mostly native plants, which provides some kind of benefit, uh, whether it's to pollinators, insects, or birds, or um, a good look, you know, could add value to your uh, look in your front yard, maybe, or backyard. Go ahead. Um, so here's a picture of firebush, and we've got a wall here with uh, interplanted with bananas, and this is just an idea. Keep going. Uh, we've got the dune sunflower I have with me. Uh, this is a great ground cover, and you can plant this in an area with fruit trees um, to help protect, keep that soil cooler instead of using just mulch. Uh, you can actually use native plants in with your edibles. And um, I'll show you more pictures, keep going. Uh, this is a commercial landscape. Uh, I actually took this picture at Chick-fil-A and they have native plants in their landscape because they know we're gonna conserve water by going with natives rather than these mainstream box store plants which mostly come from like China or some Asia. Um, so we have cabbage balm, that's a Florida native. A lot of you have seen that everywhere. Um, we have kunti plant and that stays small and it's, um, it's good for a host of a certain butterfly um, and it's evergreen, it's cold hardy, so it could be a, a, a decent ground cover for fruit trees. It, it, could, um, it does produce a little uh, like orange seed that could be toxic to pets, so beware of that. And then we've got in the background mealy grass. I don't know who designs these at a large scale because there are so many box stores doing um, uh, native landscapes, so <clears throat> I'm not sure what system they're using, uh, it, whether it's like a Florida Association of Native Nurseries, I don't know if they're plugged into uh, serving commercial landscapes, but uh, somebody has to grow and supply all these for all this new development coming in. Um, and there's also issues there. There's, there's not enough supply to keep up with all these new solar fields going in. Um, there, they are, from what I understand, there are native plants uh, in the designs for the installation with solar and they just can't keep up with demand. So installation, uh, installation companies will go to a local um, a sod supply company and just put in typical sod because it's cheaper, they'll make more profit and they can get their hands on it a little easier. So that is an issue we're facing too, but go ahead. Uh, another native plant in the landscape. Commercial, again, this is um, a Simpson stopper and they trim it like a hedge but it's fine, it does great as a hedge if you want it to. It just won't fruit or flower um, as often as it should, so go ahead. Uh, this was in the women's club at Brooksville. <clears throat> the, uh, the, my native plant society chapter in Hernando County, there was a woman that is associated with the, the women's club. She designed it and I just helped do the installation, but we have uh, some shade here, so you know, right plant, right place is important, and that's not just with edibles, of course, that's with natives. So uh, she did some of the design, and she helped put the best plants for the shady spots, and then also the best plants for the sunny spots. Um, this will mature over time as well. Go ahead. Uh, this was a backyard we did in a typical HOA. Um, I'll show you before a picture of this later, but it was just all grass, and we added the pavers um, had a, another company come in and do the pergola, which added a little value, and she put in shade underneath the pergola, um, like shade cloth, and then we surrounded with certain edible and native plants to, uh, to help with preventing shade, and then you know, bring in some uh, food she can eat, also uh, pollinators and birds can also eat in this too. So it's kind of a complete package. Um, is what I'm getting at, so go ahead. All right, this is Stokes Aster. Uh, this is a keystone plant I'll talk about later. I actually have some of those also, um, if you guys are interested. And they are, uh, they're cold hardy as well, I found out, because I'm in an area that uh, gets colder. Like, you guys have more lakes around here, so it's uh, more microclimates and stuff like that. Uh, but we, we have more hills. Um, and in the area I'm in, and we do have microclimates over there in lakes, but maybe not as many, and we, we have 
been known to get hit pretty hard, um, especially last year. That was pretty brutal for everybody. But this year, we've been pretty good. Um, and this was just a typical landscape. We kind of made it look pretty and functional. Um, it's not your typical landscape. So it's kind of artistic. Go ahead. Uh, another native plant. So uh, everybody's seen the magnolias are native. And then you can add a little feature. Um, if you do it right, you can limit your weeds and, and stuff like that, too. Um, there's a crepe myrtle, which comes from China. And the difference in these trees is the native wildlife knows these trees because how many of you are actually from Florida? Raise your hand. OK, so you guys are native. So same with the plants. They're native. Same with the birds and insects. They're native. They know this area. I'm not native. I'm from freaking Missouri. You, know, you ever been to Missouri? Who's from Missouri? Yeah, that's right. You got dreadlocks. No, you, you should get dreadlocks. But, <laughs> um, so, so anyway, uh, so yeah, I came down to the state. I'm like, man, I can grow so much stuff down here. I got to learn. Got to find out what the natives know. Well, the plants can't find out what the natives know. They come in here and they're just like, they're just, it's like a Chinese, planting a Chinese something right there and, you know, and everybody being like, oh, we don't know what that plant is. Where are they from? You know, that's exactly what's going on here. So nothing uses it. And, you know, it may look good, but when you put it in, in every freaking home and development for whatever reason, and along with sod, it adds up. It adds up. And the, uh, the, the destruction in our ecology is just not worth it. Um, we, we, had to put ed we had to put edible and native plants in our landscapes. And the more people doing it is going to add up and help. You know? But if just one of us does it, that's something. So go ahead. Uh, this was in, um, just down the road in Groveland. You guys have seen this, probably. And the sunshine mimosas. They've got a native ground cover going. I haven't had a lot of luck with ground covers. Um, they, I'm sure they have to do a lot of weeding with this. Um, but go ahead, just another commercial. This is a native lantana, not the wild one. The wild one can spread like crazy, get bushy and ugly sometimes. But this guy, he stays small, and he, he seems to look pretty good most of the year round, and attracts several different varieties of insects and uh, pollinators. So that's a good one. This lady decided to put them you know, for curb appeal. It fit right in there. You can prune. With a weed eater, you can trim this along that line. And you can do this in any front outdoor space and make, give it a clean look, you know, and it won't hurt the plant. You know, it's just pruning it back, which will actually probably make it thicker, but go ahead. There's another example of nat native plants. I got some Mexican sunflowers. They're young. That's why they look so stalky. Uh, go ahead. All right. We've got muley grass. I've got that down here. Um, we've got some extra plants. Uh, mealy grass in the, the landscape, it's mostly on golf courses I've seen, or parks, and it's great um, just for not only looks, but also it's functional in the landscape, like uh, soil erosion control, and uh, it doesn't get very tall, so yeah, it's pretty functional. Um, I like to use it around my peach trees. If I put a peach tree in the ground, I put like five mealy grasses in and around that peach tree, and so now I don't got a... a add as much mulch, and it's not like the grass is going to absorb all the nutrients from the peach. You know, it's just grass, so um, it's kind of functional. It, it also adds some you know, shade and uh, cover for the roots of the peach, so it seems to work pretty cool, uh, pretty good that way. Doing sunflower, you can manage to do stuff like that. Go ahead. Uh, we have a couple. Uh, this is a weeping holly, and you know, they get about 30 feet tall. They, you know, they're slow growers. It's hard to find a, a larger tree to buy, but um, this is just a demonstration in a park with a, a ground cover around it. Um, so, so the native mockingbird, they actually love these trees, uh, especially when they fruit, and they'll, they'll nest in there, as opposed to a non-native plant like a camphor tree, uh, which are category one invasive. They're taking over the whole freaking planet. <laughs> and, uh, well, Florida. And, yeah, so go ahead. Uh, this is a garden I've been working on. It's 5,000 square feet, so it's about an eighth of an acre. I started it out, it, it was just sugar sand, and um, I started adding as much organic matter as I could. It was a quarter of an acre when I started, and I realized 
Uh, it's a little big um, with the time I've got, so shrunk it down. And uh, through, through faith, I've been able to um, be led to certain people that have allowed me to um, do a garden like this on their property and get hands-on training with it. Um, so uh, basically just finding you know, the right plant in the right place is what it's all about, seems like, in the landscape. Uh, if you're put, if you're installing, that's what we do. We specialize in just in installations. I'm not really interested in like uh, starting a nursery and growing. I'd rather um, encourage others to do that. Like I said, there's a shortage of native plants in the landscape all over Florida, and uh, there's different network opportunities and groups that can help support you to get started for that. But I would like to buy from you and then plant them and make sure they succeed in the landscape and talk directly with uh, the homeowner. That's kind of what I like to do the most. Go ahead. There's another picture of the garden. This was last November, and we did not get hit with a freeze, so fortunately it still looks pretty good like this. Go ahead. All right, so na Why Native Plant Lives Matter, inspired by Karina Vaudry. She's a lifelong conservationist and a member of the uh, Florida Native Plant Society for 30 plus years, and she gave me some of this information in a presentation uh, called Native Plants in the Landscape, um, part one. It was a series on YouTube. It's like an hour long. It's worth listening to if you get a chance. Go ahead. Um, but she was saying uh, Florida's unique diversity because we have, uh, like I said, five growing zones, um, and we have two ecoregions. That's what I showed you on those two maps. Um, she said we have 27 magnitude springs, which each spring... It's a large system that produces about 66 million gallons of water a day, and that's uh, pretty rare compared to other parts of our, our country. Um, then there's always, in Florida, there's lots of lakes, streams, and marshes, of course. Uh, Florida contains 7% of the world's indigenous plants uh, on, the, on the planet, uh, and then 18% of indigenous plants in the U.S., um, Let's see, there's 82 plant families compared to other parts of the U.S. containing maybe like six, like where I'm from in Missouri. It's nowhere near 82. And again, that's mostly because we have such a diversity in growing zones. You know, we stretch so far north and south. And then the ecoregion is, as well. It, it goes from wet tropics to eastern um, ecoregion. So go ahead. Um, more on Florida's unique diversity. Uh, there's 700 terrestrial vertebrates in Florida, documented, and there's 35,000 invertebrates. And only in Florida, there's 410 endemic vertebrates, uh, nine endemic birds, three endemic mammals, 16 endemic fish, and all of this diversity requires native vegetation and native plants. So we would not have the diversity. And diver what did I say? Diversity is the spice of life, right? So. If we want spice in our life, we have to have diversity. And that's not just edible plants in your landscape. That's native plants in your landscape. That's caring for each other. That's caring for the planet. That's uh, following through faith and, and living life to its fullest. We're all human. We're all here to do human things. So what do humans do? We, don't, we do what we've always been doing throughout all of time and space. We grow food. We, we, we care and you know, honor and respect each other. And we see a lot of that dwindling now. Um, you know, I, th I think it's mostly because, like for me, it was, a, it was a big issue because I was always in a little bubble. I was inside in school, or I was inside in a car, or I was inside. Uh, some of us get stuck inside in a work office, and we don't get that natural human experience that we've always been uh, used to having throughout history. And um, that integrated connection with our environment, our immediate environment. So that's why we say you can't be healthy in an unhealthy environment. Plant lives matter. And if we landscape a more natural way, a healthier way, what does that look like? Well, edible native plants, duh. We can't be going around mowing our grasses and um, creating new development at such a large rate and then, and then screwing up this whole unique diversity, diverse system that all of us rely on to just live, you know? Um, our, our systems... They, they might be struggling, and that's what permaculture has to offer is uh, some solutions. To, but we're all kind of struggling in the same boat together, and we're all like, how do we figure this out before the Titanic ship sinks? 
And, uh, uh, well, you know, um, there's a, uh, keep going. The, there's a guy here named Douglas Tallamy who, he wrote a couple books. One is Nature's Best Hope. Another is Bringing Nature Home. And I actually have the book here. Um, so Bringing Nature Home, How You Can Sustain wild, Wildlife with Native Plants. He suggests that if everybody put in, um, let's say we put in half of our yard with native plants. Uh, so we re reduced our lawn, not totally get rid of it, because there's so many industries and companies and people for jobs that depend on those jobs to work in that industry. If we just get rid of our grass, it's not the solution. So let's reduce it. If we cut it in half, what would that look like? If every, every American cut their yard in half, he said, he says it's roughly 20 to 40 million acres we would conserve back to giving back to our natural environment um, based on our ecoregion. So, so um, you know, the next thing is you got to figure out you know, what is a native plant, why does it matter, um, and where to get them, how do I get involved, you know. Everybody can do their part, and uh, together it adds up, it really does. Um, it's not like we can reach. That goal anytime soon, 20 to 40 million acres is a lot, but the largest conservation area in the U.S. so far is in Alaska. It's about 17 million acres. So if we all kind of work together to say, hey, our parks aren't enough, um, we've got you know, all, all this uh, species loss and diversity loss, um, let's team up and start putting in our landscapes and changing the way we landscape a little bit more. Um, then, then we're headed in the dire right direction. And as long as we're headed in the right direction, when the Titanic's sinking, we've got a whistle and a life raft, and it's like we're blowing the whistle as Jack's like, oh my God. <laughs> no, it's kidding. <laughs> um, so, so, who is Doug telling me? He's a well known entomologist. He studies insects. That sounds kind of boring, right? That's what I thought. Uh, but as, you, as I realize more and more everything is connected, that means. Uh, studying the insects is crucial because insects feed the world. But guess what feeds the insects? It's plants. So guess what feeds our insects? It's native plants. Um, and without the insects, the humans don't eat. And without the pollinators feed, uh, pollinating our, our plants and our crops, humans don't eat. So it's all connected. We got to feed them too. If we feed them and give to them, they give right back. That's the, the nature is set up that way. Give and give and uh, little taking. Uh, go ahead. So some Doug Tallamy quotes. Um, he says, when the insects disappear, humans may not take much notice, but the recent population decline of two species have received a great deal of attention. The monarch butterfly, because it's an iconic, easily recognizable and beautiful creature, um, and the honeybee, because it's needed to pollinate crops. But those episodes are symptomatic of a larger disruption in the ecosystem. Ptolemy estimates that the worldwide population of arthropods, uh, chief, chiefly insects, has declined by 45% from pre-industrial times. Without insects, it would be the case that lizards, frogs, and toads, birds and mammals, from rodents up through bears, would lose all or large part of their diets. The little things that run the world are disappearing, he says. This is an uh, ecological crisis that we're just starting to talk about. Go ahead. If everyone, OK, I talked about this, reducing our lawns, um, the current, let's see, about 12%. What was that last one? Go back. About 12% of the US land is being permanently protected or conserved. So that's not a lot from that perspective. Um, it really isn't. So, so again, you know, our landscapes is the solution, or step forward. Anyway, go ahead. Um, food chains, this is what a, a simple version of the food chain is. You know, it's the, the cycle of life stuff. You've got the plants and then the insects and then the, the species in between until you get to the main predators, which when they decompose, gets absorbed by fungi back to the soil, and that's the cycle. So right now we're cutting out a lot of this. We're cutting out a lot of this. And when we put in more of the right native plants in the landscape, in the right place, we're going to increase this. And by increasing this, we're going to increase the rest of it. So um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of simple. It's uh, Go ahead. Let's see. Problems we're facing now, loss of diversity, over water consumption. Uh, it's estimated Floridians uh, are the world's most overused water consumption on the planet. 
and it's like the the um, let's see swift mud it's it's estimated like three billions of three billion gallons of water per day going to water our lawns but it's an overall like seven billion gallon uh, deficit per day um, all over Florida and so, like I said, we've got 27 magnitude springs times 66 million gallons that those springs are producing. It's, it's not nowhere near the, the billions that we're using every day. So we're basically sucking like a big soda straw um, all of our local water supplies. And that also is going to affect the diversity we have here in Florida. So putting in native plants, what are they? They've adapted to this area. Uh, so they're more drought tolerant and they're more disease resistant and they feed insects and pollinators. It's a win, win, win. Uh, it's obvious. So um, less pollinators for our crops and plants is what we're facing. Uh, we're facing less food resources. Um, let's see. Uh, we're, we're, we're facing increase in our ignorance to our surrounding environments, of course. You know, some kids think that food comes from the back of grocery stores now and that's it. So... Um, that's the connection they have, um, along with you know, the, the phone. It's uh, very disruptive in, in our lives. And um, not to say it's bad, I'm just saying it's not balanced. And it, it could, there could be improvements for sure. Go ahead. Common developed landscapes. So typical stuff here, podocarpus, um, a lot of box store grasses and shrubs. And... Uh, crotons are obvious, um, the oyster plant, and uh, there's like queen palms and a lot of foreign plants that uh, are cheap. They're cheap, and uh, a lot of them come from uh, like Asia, then they get shipped over to Miami where there's huge warehouses, then they distribute all over to big box stores. And people think when they move to Florida, they think, Oh, we want to decorate our landscape. They look around the neighborhood, they see what everybody's got. And what everybody's got is this typical Chinese stuff, which the native wildlife doesn't know. And so now we've clear cut hundreds of acres to just put in sod and Chinese plants. And there's no balance there. It's very out of balance. That's why we're seeing such a large increase in uh, deforestation and species loss and desert desertification, you know, over water use. Because it's kind of our stupidity, really. It's just human stupidity kind of explains a lot here. So, so the Chinese plants plus, go ahead, invasive, invasive species, go ahead, equals, go ahead, dead zone. That's what we've got, large-scale dead zones. So putting in native plants um, along with edible plants is bringing back the life in that landscape, which is going to bring back the life um, so that all of us can live. <laughs> Go ahead. We want to live, right? Who wants to live here? Who wants to live? No one? What the? Okay, whatever. I'll leave. I'm out of here. Good. I'm done. Time's up? All right, good. Total acres of land in Florida, 34 million acres. Uh, and total acres of estimated invasive plants in Florida, over 1 million acres. Um, developed, development acreage in Florida per year, 180,000 acres per year. In 20 years equals over 3 million acres. So that's kind of just an idea of um, the, the land being consumed by invasive plants and then developed areas. So um, it adds up. Go ahead. Um, what the pros say. So Doug Tellamy created homegrownnationalpark.org. If you've never been to that website, uh, it's a good one. You can write it down. Um, and they've got everything on there from... Um, just any resources you want to find on native plants locally, they've got it. They've got a nice map. They've, they, they've got something called uh, put be on the map. So you can, when you do a plant installation, um, you can also note it in their inventory, and then they'll get an overall idea of how many acres we're restoring per year all over the U.S. So these are like the, these are the leading guys doing this all over this nation. And the, the Native Plant Society, there's a chapter near you. It's um, in Mount Dora. It's called Lake Elder Lake uh, Beautyberry is the name of the chapter. And if you're not a member of the Native Plant Society, highly encourage you to do so because the native plants are the backbone of our 
our culture and our lives. And what we've got is a bunch of older people sitting in groups just holding on to the last legs of what we've got. And if my generation doesn't pick it up, I joined the Native Plant Society in my chapter two years ago and just learned as much as I could uh, just because I understand the importance of it. But being there helped me understand it more. And, um, and there's really a lot of good people in those groups, too. So uh, anyway, um, so let's see. The world population more than doubled in the past 60 years. So that caused a lot of new development and a lot of stupidity because we grew so fast. We're like, well, what do we do? How do we feed everybody? So it leads into chemical farming and all this stuff, um, which at least, at least we've lived this long. But <laughs> I don't know how much longer we've got here with uh, the, the rate we're destroying our environment. We can't be healthy in an unhealthy environment because it's, it's connected. Um, estimated 27,000 species are going totally extinct yearly across the globe. Uh, only a few million known on the globe total. So uh, that's kind of sad. Um, go ahead. If that's 100% if that's true, that is pretty sad. Let's see. The, the population of the US, now over 330 million people, has more than doubled since most of us were kids, older generation. Um, and it continues to grow by 4,800 people each day. All of those additional souls together with cheap gas, our love affairs with the car, and our quest to own ever larger homes have fueled unprecedented development that continues to sprawl over 2 million uh, additional acres per year, the size of Yellowstone National Park. The Chesapeake Bay watershed has lost 100 acres of forest each day since 1985. We have connected all of our developments with 4 million miles of roads, and their combined paved surface, surface is nearly five times the size of New Jersey. Somewhere along the way, we decided to convert most of our living and working spaces into huge expanses of lawn. So far, we have planted over 62,500 square miles some 40 million acres in lawn. Each weekend, we mow an area the size of New England to within one inch and then congratulate ourselves on a job well done. And it's not as though these little woodlots and open spaces we have not, we have not paved or manicured are, uh, are pristine. Nearly all are second growth forests that have been overtaken by invasive Asian plants like autumn olive, multiflora rose, oriental bittersweet, um, porcelain berry, buck, uh, buckthorn, privet, and bush honeysuckle. These are mostly native where he's located. This is Doug Tallamy's quote. Um, he's up in Delaware area, so um, that's stuff he sees because he's a little colder, um, but that's stuff he sees pretty often. Keep going. With all this destruction that we've created, <coughs> happening all over Florida. All of this land behind me will shortly become new developed houses after being uh, clear cut and totally wiped clean. Thankfully, at the entrance of this community, they've planted some native plants which will help sustain some of the loss from uh, deforestation and wiping all this land clear. They've reinstalled some natives like this magnolia, these live oak trees, and cabbage palms. So these are all Florida native, along with some of this painted mealy grass they have here. will help provide less loss, create a little balance uh, to all the destruction and deforestation we've created here with our new development happening all over Florida. Hey, Stephen, you want to start talking? Yeah, keep, okay. keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> keep going. This is a camper tree. I'm sure you've seen it growing around your neighborhood. Keep in going. Florida. You can find me on uh, TikTok, Instagram, all that stuff, um, if we had more time. Uh, so here's what, real quick, here's what native plants provide. It's, they provide diversity, food security, water conservation, uh, preserving our native ecosystems and their inhabitants, like pollinators, uh, et cetera. Attractive, they can be attractive in color and fully functional, um, and they support our local economies and lowers our negative ecological footprints because now we're working and supplying jobs to 
you know, keep up and restore a lot of native plants in our landscape. So that's growers and installers and uh, maintenance and um, education and all that stuff. Keep going. Top five native plants for any landscape. This is the reason why you came. <laughs> Welcome to the start of my presentation. <laughs> We're just starting, right? We got an hour. We got an hour? All right, here we go. So we got mealy grass. Mealy grass. This is mealy grass. It gets pink tips. I showed you a picture of it earlier. Looks pretty good in landscape. Had plenty of these uh, extra uh, if you guys want some. Uh, mulberry. So the red mulberry is um, the, the well-known native, but there's different uh, cultivated varieties. And the one I brought is the ever-bearing uh, mulberry, which is a dwarf variety. Can fit in a lot of landscapes. Gets about 15, 20 feet tall and about 15 feet wide, but can be heavily pruned, easily propagated. It's already fruiting. They fruit like crazy. Uh, they do flower too. Um, so different things can eat the fruit, uh, birds and whatnot, people. Um, but the, the, the other varieties, they tend to get larger, so be careful where you plant those. Um, then we've got beach sunflower. And that's, uh, that's a native plant you'll see when you go to the ocean. Often, uh, there's railroad vine is out there a lot. Uh, you might see mealy grass. I can't remember seeing mealy. But um, beach sunflower just grows along the beach, so it grows in the sand. It likes to sit up high in the dunes. So if you have an area in your permaculture farm or um, landscape that uh, is a little elevated, this would be good for that. And it's, it, it covers the ground um, in a good area, like maybe eight square feet, four by four. And uh, yeah, it looks attractive. It feeds a lot of pollinators. I have it covering, you know, lots of a lot of square footage in my garden, and it's just uh, it's cold hardy too. So, <clears throat> also spreads so that you can uh, harvest a lot of the the new seeds and new growth, and then you can pot that up and give that away or sell it. Um, coral honeysuckle. This is a climber, and this has the showy red flowers, which uh, hummingbirds like flowers like this. They like red. They like cones where they can stick their beak in. And this will climb. Um, it does good in partial shade. It will climb your oaks because the oaks have small leaves. They get dappled light, which allows stuff like this and passion fruit and other things to, to climb and grow. Um, coral honeysuckle, that's what that is. And then I have the um, Simpson stopper, which is great for the landscape in a hedge. has edible red berry. Uh, birds can nest in it. And it's high in vitamin C the uh, berries are. So you guys probably know a lot of this already, but um, I have extra plants if you guys need some supply. Um, go ahead. I pretty much covered these. Go ahead. Go ahead. Keep going. It's elderberry or mulberry. Uh, mulberry. That's dune sunflower. Keep going. There you go. There's coral honeysuckle. Coral honeysuckle has edible flowers, by the way. I forgot to mention that. Keep going. OK, additional plants to consider. There's the firebush, wild basil. I brought wild basil. And this one smells really good. If you guys want to pass this around, it's not too dirty. I don't know if you guys want to get some smells in, get a good sense of what, what's going on here. OK, and then we've got uh, tropical sage is another honorable mention. Um, it can get kind of lengthy and a little bushy, but uh, it feeds a lot of pollinators year round. This is a good one. Um, and then when it clusters and spreads, um, it'll, you'll show, it'll show more color. You know, it's kind of thin right now, but in groups it's better. That's another one. I don't know if you want to pass that around. And then this is Stokes Aster. Has the purple flower, and it only gets about two feet tall. It does great in the shade uh, or moist areas. Um, but you can put it in your flower beds too. It works pretty good. It's cold hardy and it gets bigger, of course, but uh, uh, I'm not gonna pass that one. Um, you can pass these around. Yeah, it does. It's a purple flower and it flowers a lot of the year round. Right now it's uh, kind of its off season, but uh, it kind of rotates throughout the year and it's purple. It's a beautiful, deep purple color. It looks really good. Um, so yeah, so these are uh, some of my favorite edible plants, or uh, native plants, but some of them are edible. Uh, spiderwort's edible, it's a purple flower. Elderberries, edible. Yopon holly, there's a company uh, in uh, Deltona, Florida, that 
Um, they have a, a, like a Yopon Holly business where they make the tea and um, they sell that. Uh, see. Um, cabbage palm, that's edible. Beauty berries, edible. Wild basil is edible. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, a lot of, there's a lot of uh, functional plants here for sure that are honorable mentions. But these, these go good in uh, most landscapes because they're, they cover a wide range of uh, different areas. Like if you need a shady area to hedge, there's your Simpson stopper or sun. Um, and there's, with Simpson stopper, there's uh, a, dwarf, a dwarf variety, so you don't gotta worry about it getting too big. Otherwise, they can get like 20, 30 feet tall. I've seen some mature ones under oak trees. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's Stokes Aster, um, tropical salvia, basil, firebush, beauty berry, blur, blur. That's a good plant, blur. And okay, keystone plants, support species for all of life. So Doug Talmy again, bringing nature home and the homegrown national park.org. Go ahead. Keystone plants, I found this chart resource and I think it was through Doug Talamy. Um, it just covers, so, so Doug talks about the insects that are um, more adapted to the ecoregion and these are the ones that we need to support the most because they're so well adapted, when plants, uh, when, they, when they get mature in an area for hundreds or thousands of years, they uh, secrete like toxicity and stuff to keep insects from eating them. Well, a lot of these other, these uh, insects that we want to support are the ones that have developed immunity to a lot of these plants. And they eat and pollinate the most out of any other insects. So. Um, these are some plants, some trees that uh, we want to be definitely, definitely planting. Um, so the sand laurel oak supports 395 estimated caterpillar species alone, just that. So, you know, we do see a lot of new development with a lot of oak trees put in back in place and uh, cabbage bombs. So that's, that's a plus for sure, but it's not enough. Um, then there's the, the cherry laurel. That, those things grow like a weed. I'm sure you've seen them. Um, <clears throat> they're super hardy. And uh, they like to grow up right alongside pine trees. And, and birds will sp spread the berries wherever. So, um, you know, they, could, they grow really fast. So they could be used also for maybe firewood or um, uh, chop and drop or something. But uh, the cherry laurel, that's, that supports 247 uh, caterpillar species. Um, box elder supports a lot. The American elm tree supports a lot. Um, <clears throat> goldenrod and asters always support a lot. Uh, sunflower, native sunflowers, they support a lot of uh, pollinators and species. Let's see. Um, yeah, almonds, uh, apricot, cherry, peach, plum, they support a lot. Uh, the maple does, the pines do, blueberries, deerberry, cranberry, um, blackberry, raspberries do. <clears throat> you can kind of go down the list, but you can find all this um, probably through, I'm pretty sure I found it through um, the homegrownnationalpark.org. Um, anyway, go ahead, keep going. Uh, let's see. So specialist insects, that's what I was talking about. These are the ones that have adapted to eat uh, more vegetation. These are the insects we want to uh, support with these keystone native plants. Go ahead. Uh, live oak trees, they're keystone. Um, here on this sign where I bought this, where I can buy live oak trees, they have listed wildlife it supports. The acorn support dozens of birds and mammals, including deer, black bears, squirrels, Wild turkey, nesting habitat for scrub jays, larval hosts for um, a type of butterfly, and so on, so on. And that's, that's what we're talking about when we say keystone. A keystone is basically like building blocks set up like an archway bridge, and that keystone is uh, one of the main um, connectors that keep that bridge running and su supported. So. Uh, so keystone plants actually support all of 
this uh, wildlife in, in our lives too. Um, so oak trees are like at the top of that. And that's all over the US. There's many different varieties of oak trees, but I really like the live oak tree. And I think the sand live oak tree is the one that supports uh, the most in this eco region. So um, go ahead. Keep, uh, wild black cherry, that's another good one. Supports a lot from the fruit to um, the flowers and just habitat. Go ahead. Goldenrod, there's some goldenrod, sunflower, and ast uh, Stokes aster is a type of aster. And then also Black Eyed Susan is another good one um, for supporting more spe species. <coughs> That's the Stokes aster right here, yeah. And it, there's clusters of purple flowers about to bloom right here. Uh, you can barely see it, but there's a stem here. And they'll all flower uh, most of the year round. They're cold hardy too. Um, yeah, it's a great plant. And they do good in shade, so you could plant them underneath um, fruit trees and stuff as well. <clears throat> Go ahead. This is a live oak tree. Go ahead. Let me skip that. Goldenrod. This is a native plant. Keep going. All right, so native plants in the landscape. A uh, quick review. What is a native plant? A plant that has been well integrated or established for long periods of time in a region. Why does it matter? With the increase in development, there also is an increase in species depopulation, deforestation, desertification, um, and uh, our local uh, life uh, that we all require to live. So estimated 800,000 people move to Florida every single day. Up to 500 acres per day are going to development. Um, and that's about half the size of the county I'm in every year all over Florida getting developed and will keep continue as development keeps going. So we can't fight development, but we can take action by just putting in native plants and joining the Native Plant Society and supporting um, native plant nurseries, stuff like that. Um, keep going. Uh, here's some resources at the bottom here. I have uh, more, I have these to hand out, um, or it would actually save uh, a little bit of hassle if you could take pictures of it. Um, Let's see, but I do have more of these to hand out. I can leave these, uh, yeah, up front there, and if you snap a picture of it, that helps. But uh, there's, like I said, there's native plant society cha chapters all over Florida, and joining that would be a good step in the right direction. Um, uh, you can always support Doug Tallamy and his projects. Um, he has a lot of free information online, and he is, He's very active. He gives a lot of talks. It'd be cool to see him down here. I think uh, Florida Association of Native Nurseries, um, they've had him as a guest speaker in the past, but uh, he's getting older, so um, yeah. Uh, let's keep going, let's see what I got more. Um, our mission and future goals, we're committed to creating healthy landscapes with Plant Lives Matter. <clears throat> we're finding simple solutions to help promote as many edible native plant landscapes within Central Florida as possible. We aim to restore at least one full acre of healthy landscapes per year. Last week I put in 100 plants in the ground, both edible and native. And if I can keep doing that, stay on that trajectory, then it adds up. Um, but I need, to, I need a lot. I need to put in like a lot of square footage just to, to, to reach that goal. But if I can get to that goal, um, then that's something. It's something. It's helpful. Okay, so here's before and after Plant Lives Matter, typical Chinese landscape. I added milkweed um, and then some pintas, tropical sage, and cranberry hibiscus in there. And I pulled out, there was Mexican petunias in here. Everybody likes the stupid Mexican petunia. I've seen it take over the woods and uh, it's a nuisance to get rid of. When people hire me to dig that crap out, I say, oh no, that's terrible. Uh, Thankfully, she just planted these. They haven't really spread much, so I just ripped them out. Actually made a video recently of it. Threw them away, and then put in natives. So keep go you can just go kind of through this, just before and after. This gives you an idea visually, um, which is very helpful. This was a 1,000 square foot garden converted. <coughs> it's a typical like golf course community. Um, she's very grateful of this project and she uses it, which is great. When the, when the people actually use and engage, 
their new landscape, that's what you want. And I, I talk with her regularly, we're friends, and I'll help her, give her tips, you know, as she goes and stuff. Um, I have a handful of people I do that for. Keep going. These are all before and afters. Oh, this is a boxwood, typical uh, landscape shrub you find in like Lowe's, for example. It didn't do well here, it died. So this client, um, he uh, hired me to put in the right plant in the right place. This, this area stays wet. He waters his St. Augustine here, which is very pricey. And I put in wax myrtle, which grew six freaking feet in one year because it was in the right place. It was in full sun and it loved the moisture. So it shot up and now I just keep it trimmed and uh, birds can use it and it flowers. It even flowers being trimmed because I don't trim it uh, monthly. So it'll flower. Um, here's a before and after. That's that one. It was just grass before. It's a recent one. This, so this is, she calls it a botanical garden. <laughs> I, t I try to fit, fit in a lot of native and edible plants together densely to make it like a park and to shade out a lot of weeds. But she had this ugly hill that wouldn't hold grass or nothing and she's getting older, she didn't like mowing. So it made sense to put in some plants that she can add some beauty uh, and look at and then automatically, as soon as I bring the plants, I always see a butterfly or birds watching me. Like they know, they, they see the food, they're like, ooh, he's got food. So that, I swear to God, as I drive around the counties, there's flocks of stuff like eyeballing me, like that guy's got my, my food. <laughs> so they know me now, I guess. The word's getting out. <laughs> that was a good one for native plants. I planted it really thick, though. This is Mexican petunia, and we turned it into uh, something a little less crazy. Uh, here I put in a peach tree with the mealy grass, and I, I didn't even mulch it, but I did put in fertilizer, uh, just manure, and uh, <clears throat> I had to take out the existing shrubs. So this is a common uh, plant group right here. We've got the vinca, um, you, that's what they call it at Lowe's, and then the uh, blue days. That's red, white, and blue colors, but you can also do red, white, and blue, tropical salvia and spiderwort, or Stokes Aster, or fill in a blank. You can get creative like that. Um, and they, they, they both flower around. They give different looks, but those will get bigger. Those are still young. And I mean, it's not too much different, but it does make it ecological different when things are actually using the plants and it's not a dead, wasted space. Great. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, Johnny Cash. Who likes Johnny Cash? <laughs> All right. So this is the downtown welcome center. I put in native plants after they put the mermaid in there in Brooksville. Um, this is a new project we just created. It's called Figs Kits, and uh, it stands for food, in, food Installed Garden Security. And we have 14 different kits, and each kit is uh, roughly 100 square feet. Uh, comes with a fixed plant list, fixed price. And people, the idea is people just choose what kit they want, and we come and install it. Um, there's a video on it, but I also got the website launched. And of course, you cannot be healthy in an unhealthy environment. Plant lives matter. This is a healthy way to landscape. So that's it. Thank you.